Here's my book review of The Mackerel Plaza by Peter DeVries. I credit humorist and poet Peter DeVries as the godfather of boy chick lit, comedies about boys and men who are less than careful with their life choices, particularly their choices of romantic partners. The Mackerel Plaza is one of the funniest books you will ever read. That is, provided you have a sense of humor about both religion and the lusts of the flesh. Reverend Mackerel has a problem. His saintly wife has recently passed away. He suspects she's enjoying a better life. But while he's still on earth, he'd like to remarry. And conveniently enough, he's been secretly dating the church secretary, Miss Calico. His congregation is so respectful of his wife's legacy that they wish to erect a new shopping mall named in her honor, the Macro Plaza. The preacher rightly worries that the couple would have to wait years to set the date, not until the plaza is built, the dedication is done, and the luster of his wife's post-mortem fame begins to fade. A humorous novel must have an engine of comedy, which generates conflict, embarrassment, and laughter. An outwardly righteous man who harbors secret lusts is just such a formula. Certainly men and women of the cloth have the same urges and flaws as the rest of us, but in someone whose social position is exalted, discovering their hypocrisies gives them farther to fall. And we do so love it when our comic characters go splat. The Macroplaza was published in 1958, back when making fun of straying fundamentalist preachers wasn't politically incorrect. Author DeVries grew up in a Dutch Reformed church in Chicago, and yay, those strictures give a guy a real cramp of the you-know-where. So painful, it's hysterical. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of Bonfire of the Vanderbilts. Here's my throwback, and I don't care if it's Thursday. During the Civil War, an amazing incident happened in July 1864. At Maryland's Monocacy River, Union forces blocked the Confederacy from burning down Washington, D.C. The Confederate force was a gigantic war machine of 15,000 skilled and hardened troopers. The Union force was a group of unskilled, hundred-day men, farmers and homesteaders, numbering only 5,000, a titmouse facing a panther. Confederate General Jubal Early loved sacking cities and demanding ransoms. Union General Lewis Wallace had been reduced in rank because of the Shiloh carnage. But for a full day, Wallace's tiny force stonewalled the Confederates, enabling General Grant to ride up and kick them away. This amazing feat of grit and courage saved the capital and restored Wallace rank. Now we go to 12 years later. Wallace relates he was on a train arguing with Senator Robert Ingersoll about religion. Ingersoll was a notorious atheist agnostic. Here history gets a bit fuzzy. Wallace claimed the talk inspired research on the wars of Roman armies and the Israelites. Ingersoll denied it happened. Whatever the truth, Wallace studied tactics, strategy, terrain, and concluded with a military eye, nobody could defeat Rome. A change of strategy called Christianity was adopted. Many Germanic tribes that conquered Rome were Arius Christians, a sect seeing Jesus as a great leader. Wallace converted to Christianity but in 1880, while New Mexico governor, Wallace's novel Ben-Hur became the most successful novel in history. Civil War victory, governorship, and a gigantic novel should satisfy anybody. But another melodrama hit Wallace, Billy the Kid. Wallace offered Billy a pardon during the Lincoln County Wars, but it collapsed. But think about an alternative history story. Ben-Hur versus Billy the Kid. That is my kind of movie. Thomas Page is the author of the sci-fi cult classic, The Man Who Would Not Die, and co-host along with Cheyenne Cockrell on the Get Published radio show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones. Here's my book review of The Woody by Peter Lefcourt. I hold author Peter Lefcourt in high regard as a skilled practitioner of what I call boy-chick lit, or male-centered comic fiction. 
The Woody is a wacky satire about boneheaded liaisons in Washington politics, featuring an unlucky congressman who gets caught with his pants down. The appearance of this book in the late 1990s coincided with the early Clinton scandals, although it's just possible the events that inspired it had more to do with the embarrassments of Gary Hart's earlier presidential campaign. As Jackie Mason said, that guy was on top of everything. It's stunning to think how innocent those days now seem by comparison. But as a lesson in electoral politics, along with hysterical examples of how politicians screw things up, you can't beat it. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of Bonfire of the Vanderbilts and host of the Get Published radio show. Here's my book review of An Object of Beauty by Steve Martin. You may already know that actor-comedian Steve Martin not only writes gags and skits, but also screenplays, plays, and several books. An Object of Beauty is a humorous novel about a scheming young woman making her way in the Aristo world of New York art galleries. Oh, and you can add art connoisseur, historian, and collector to Martin's credentials. He has his own multi-million dollar private collection, Main character Lacey Yeager is a looker with brains who has no qualms about sleeping her way to the top of the art world rat heap. She is sexy, clever, manipulative, shameless, and almost totally heedless. In this story, she goes from being a newbie intern to proprietor of her own trendy gallery. And along the way, she goes through boyfriends almost as often as the Manhattan fashion trends shift. There's the serious, caring, metrosexual journalist, a gallery owner or two, a pop artist, a rich playboy broker who may be a scammer, and an FBI agent. You'll learn a lot about art, how it's made, how it's valued, and what's in and what's out. Lacey is one of those characters whose outrageous attitudes don't fail to fascinate. She'll hold your attention and keep you guessing what clever ploy she'll try next. But oddly enough, for a book so well-crafted, there are several major plot threads that simply go nowhere or are resolved in uninteresting ways. Did Martin get bored with them? Or did he decide those yarns would be too much of a hassle to spin out or explain? Or is he somehow saying, that's life, that situation you're worried about might not turn out as you expect. In fact, it might not go anywhere at all. For example, I'm dying to know whether there's a Rembrandt under that Russian painting. So if you happen to run into Steve in the grocery store, please ask him for me. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of Bonfire of the Vanderbilts and host of the Get Published radio show. Here's my book review of The Map and the Territory by Michelle Houlebeck. This French novelist is unabashedly and unashamedly literary and intellectual. Those of us on this side of the pond who fret about novels and commercialism envy the opportunity to wax philosophical and not only get away with it, but actually sell books. This is the story of a fine artist, Jed Martin. It's also about a ghastly murder. One connection is that the murder was performed in such a way as to create a work of art. Jed's difficult relationship with his aging master architect father is a subplot upon which many heady sub-themes are hung, including the relationship between habitation and the quality of life, and no less than the fate of civilization. Hulebeck makes himself a principal character, by name. The relationship between life and art is open to question, that is, between the physical description of the French novelist and his volatile temperament. The Hulebeck in the narrative is not what you'd call a nice person, and certainly not someone you'd consider taking on as a friend. The author seems proud he's alienating you, else why talk so unashamedly of his body odor and his atrocious manners. Main character Martin's life is well-to-do Parisian, but mundane. He has an extended affair with a Russian media executive named Olga. She is one hot babe, apparently, but even she can't hold his interest. I may reread this book someday to study what I missed on the first reading, which is probably a lot. I do know that based on his descriptions of Martin's paintings, I'd love to see them. I expect they would be photorealistic and iconic like old Chinese communist propaganda posters. One of the delights of this book is imagining what these weird fictional works would look like. 